Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy, where we take philosophy, mix it with beer, and apply it to the questions you deal with every day. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. I'm Anastasia here with Mike and John, and this week we're discussing the U.S. Constitution and its supremacy clause and how that relates to treaties. But before we get started, what are we drinking, guys? We are drinking Tampa style lager <laughs> from the Cigar City Brewing Company in Tampa, Florida. This is a 4.3% ABV. 4.5. 4.5% ABV. I thought I was correcting it properly. Here, 4.3 if you're blind. 4.3 if you're blind. I'm excited about this. This is a, a company that we haven't had before. Yes. yes. It's been a long time since our go to uh, beer stop has had a brewery that we both wanted to try but hadn't tried before. Mm. Uh, oh, wow. That is yellow. Mm. Yeah. It's pretty, though. I think gold is the... Almost a, a champagne color. Yeah. It's pretty. I like it. <laughs> All right. So, treaties and the Constitution. Yeah. So, we've... we've I have made this assertion, and it's been, I think, unchallenged many times, um, that uh, treaties uh, uh, trump the Constitution. I, yeah, I've actually yeah, said yeah. that. Now, I, I went back through, and, and the whole idea of the show started from, I've said that, but I wanted to challenge my idea, because there, there's something that, that seems nonsensical almost about the statement. Um, but it, it came from a show we did, I think it was part of our Government Gone Wild series, where we looked at the Constitution, and we found out, I think at the time my assertion actually wasn't that it trumped it, but that it was on equal standing yeah, yeah. with the Constitution. And then somehow in my mind that evolved to Trump and then it, it evolved to this show. So I really wanted to do a research deep dive into that question. And it, it gets us back into a little bit of political stuff. You know, early on we were doing a lot more constitutional and political philosophy and we kind of went into morality and kind of stayed there for a while. But this is going to be fun to get back. It is. I'm looking forward to getting into politics again. This is kind of my bread and butter. So Absolutely. So, it's my toast. first place. Your... No, she meant to say she's toasted. Oh, okay. okay. No, that makes sense. On my way, though. <laughs> that makes sense. So, whenever, whenever we want to look at treaties, at least from from the U.S. and domestic perspective, uh, the first place obvious to look is the Constitution itself, and th there are two places in the Constitution that talk about treaties. Uh, the first one is Article 2, Section 2. In Article 2, dealing with the president, it says, He shall have power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties, provided two-thirds of the senders present concur. So if two-thirds, so the president can go and make treaties, whatever treaties he wants, but it's not confirmed until two-thirds of the Senate confirm yeah, that's it. that's right, that's right. All right. So strictly senatorial power. Yes. Yeah. So seems fairly straightforward. Uh, was it 70 senators? 67. 67. 67 Math senators. Math is better than mine. History yes. teacher. History teacher. Um, so uh, we, we, have, we have that. The, the second one is the Supremacy Clause. And this one actually, uh, in, in very vague terms, is where the, the confusion comes from. It says, this Constitution... And the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby, and, and anything in the Constitution or laws of any state, to the contrary, notwithstanding." So it, it says it's the supreme law. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now, supreme is not a word we use a lot these days unless we're talking about pizza. So I want Or a really good band from the 1960s. I don't think anyone talks about that anymore, Mike. Right. Well, Isn't that also a skateboard brand? And a court. Oh, yeah, them too. Yeah, a court, yeah. 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 So I wanted to look up what does supreme mean. And it means superior to all others or a rich creamy sauce. So I can't believe you had to look up Supreme, but okay. I, well, yeah, I, yeah. I think you want to make sure there's yeah, no... Yeah. There's no, yeah. al no alternate. Yeah, you're yeah. not using some yeah. colloquial understanding. Yeah. Yeah. So it says it says superior to all others. So so I, I want to I hit part of this again. Um, 
uh, and all treaties or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. Yeah. I mean, that seems clear to me. It's the highest law of the land. But as I read back through this, it, I, I did find something to take pause at, right? Because it mentions the Constitution and treaties, but it mentions something else. It mentions the laws of the United States. And whenever we mention the laws of the United States, I think we need to take pause because I don't think there's any confusion that the laws are um, uh, 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 below, I can't think of the word I'm looking for, are, are below... Subordinate. Subservient. That's the word I was looking for. Are subservient to the Constitution. Or subordinate. You could use subordinate, <laughs> yeah. but I'm going to use subservient. Okay. Um, but that the laws are subservient to the Constitution, and we don't read this to mean that, that the laws are on equal footing with Constitution. So that was my first place where I really kind of took pause with this belief. Yeah, at least, at least in this nation, there, there's yeah. a difference. Uh, yeah. In other nations, Constitution is, is all of your laws. Our, mm -hmm. In ours, we have a Constitution, and then we have statutory laws. Yeah. Thank you, England. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But so so th that that was kind of my constitutional reading. So then after after looking at that, I really wanted to take a dive into what is the legal understanding because the 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 strict wording of the constitution and modern legal understanding are not necessarily easy to derive from each other. Would no, you No, I I I agree. Yeah. I, I I think that sometimes they they intentionally write things vague uh, with vagaries. Uh, so, so they can be interpreted, and it's easier to uh, to work in the system. Yeah, absolutely. So, when I started looking at at modern legal understanding, I, I actually came across this idea that there are four types of treaties, which the Constitution only mentions one treaty. So, I think we need to to talk a little bit about what kinds of treaties there are. The four kinds, uh, and, and there are two subgroups. The first subgroup is executive agreements. Yep. And these come in two flavors, presidential executive agreements and congressional executive agreements. Fairly straightforward. Um, the idea of these derive from the idea that there are some things the president or Congress can just do. They don't need um, a, a treaty to do it. So if, if the president or Congress can just do something, let's say... Let's say we wanted to make a treaty. I'm not oversimplify this. That every time a, a foreign uh, 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 king or, or whatever wanted to come in, that we were going to roll out a red carpet and give him a nice meal. Well, the president can do that anyway. So why would he need to go through this whole treaty process? Yeah, if it's something that's that's already a a, a listed power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so we call that an executive agreement. Now, now, the thing that's interesting about this is that although domestically we recognize these things as different, under international law, these are still recognized as treaties, the same as all yeah, treaties. Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, under what they call, call juice cogens, the idea of, 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 a, of a common justice or a common law. Uh, there, there, there's an old, old tradition dating back to the Greeks and the Romans that uh, – you know that 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 if a, a deal is made between two states, that that it has to be uh you know it has to be honored. Right. And and they don't recognize the difference. You're 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 right. Yeah. So very very old tradition. Yeah. So so there's a domestic and international difference here, but domestically we we recognize a strict limitation on these, and congressional uh, uh, executive agreements are kind of along the same line of thought. They have a little more power because Congress has a little more power in the types of things they can do. They can do a broader range of things. So we, we say the same thing. Anything Congress could do without the treaty power, then we can do with a congressional agreement. And that just means the president said it, and then it went through the state and the House with a majority in both. Just like an act of Congress, right? Yeah. yeah. Real simple. So those two, the, I don't think there's a whole lot there to dive into. But then we get into Article 2 treaties. And and, and that's, that, that, that's just the name given to anything that's done under this Article 2. And there are actually two flavors of those that have emerged. There are non-self-executing and self-executing. This is where we get in the deep, the deep water, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. A little rough. Now we're actually going to spend the bulk of this podcast talking about non-self-executing um, uh, Article Two treaties because, as we'll see later, there's actually, depending on what your view is of them, a lot more power in non-self-executing treaties. Then there isn't self-executing treaties. 
but before we get into the real deep non-self-executing treaties, I want to go and talk about self-executing treaties okay. for just a little bit. Now, um, self-executing treaties are treaties that by their very signing, by the very uh, agreement of the president and, and two-thirds of, of the Senate, and that's going to be important later that it's the Senate that does it, that they make effectively a law. Now, it's not a law that's on our books the same way other laws are, but it's effectively a law because it creates a pathway for the courts to act upon government, possibly individuals. So that's, that, that gets now, into a, a little bit weirder space there. You, you said the courts. I want to kind of talk. Are, are you talking about uh, national courts or international courts? I'm talking about domestic courts. Okay. Yeah. So domestic courts can take these and use them in their ruling and yeah. rule because this treaty just exists. Now, when I got into this, the, the, one of the, the last questions of my research was, okay, I know treaties exist. I can go read them. They're publicly available. And I read this treaty. How do I know if I'm reading a self-executing or a non-self-executing treaty? And, and real quick as a point on non-self-executing treaties, it just means that it's a, a formal agreement's made, but then Congress has to come through and make a law to make the thing actually happen. So how do I know which I'm reading? I started researching that question. That is apparently one of the deepest and most highly disputed questions in law right now. So it's not altogether clear, and there is apparently hundreds of uh, legal articles on this, but I read one. So <laughs> You picked the most important one, though. Yeah, the yeah. one that came up on the yeah. top the, of the Google search. The, the, the one with, the, with all the right answers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I, I went through one, and, and they gave a, a, a four-pronged test to test if a... Uh, uh, Article 2 treaty was self-executing or not self-executing. I'm going to read a few excerpts from that. Um, so, um, I dis this is from a paper called Four Doctrines of Self-Executing Treaties, and I will put a link uh, in descriptions. Uh, a distinction has become entrenched in United States law between treaties that are self-executing and those that are not. This precise nature of distinction is... Indeed, its very existence is a matter of some controversy and much confusion. More than one lower federal court has pronounced the distinction to be most confounding in the United States law of treaties. All right, so that, that's just setting up for the confusion. And now on self-executing treaties, bringing coherence and analytical clarity to this area of law requires recognition that the self-executing doctrine addresses at least four distinct types of reasons why a treaty might be judicially unenforceable. And what they're talking about there when they say it's judicially unenforceable is saying that things that hit one of these four points, because they're judicially unenforceable, are effectively non-self-executing. We The judiciary can't just treat them like a law. Yeah, yeah. Okay? So we'll go through the four. Uh, first, a treaty might be judicially unenforceable because the parties or perhaps the U.S. treaty makers unilaterally made it judicially unenforceable. This is primarily a matter of intent. So you could just make a treaty and say, I don't, I don't want this to be self-executing, and, and that's enough to say it's not self-executing, right? <clears throat> and that could be done in, in a myriad of ways that, you know, w without diving into it, but, but it could be intent or it could be explicit. Second, a treaty might be judicially unenforceable because... The obligation it imposes is of a type that under our system of separated powers cannot be enforced directly by the courts. This branch of the doctrine calls for a judgment concerning the allocation of treaty enforcement power as between the courts and the legislature. Okay. So this, this kind of rings back to Marbury v. Madison. The court had to rule on what the court could rule on. Yeah. And it's conceivable that a treaty could be addressing an issue that the court just doesn't have the right to rule on. And if that was the case, then you would need Congress to act to make a law for the judiciary to even consider it. Sure, sure. That, and that okay. makes sense. Yeah. Uh, third, 
a treaty might be judicially unenforceable because the treaty makers lack the constitutional power to accomplish by treaty what they purported to accomplish. This branch of the doctrine calls for a judgment about the allocation of legislative power between the treaty makers and the lawmakers. So this is saying that that Congress never had the authority to even do X. Uh, or maybe they had the authority to do it, but not in the way that they did. And and, and, and that gets into the, the thing with the House, because one point that's going to become important later in this discussion is the way the treaties are set up, the House never gets a say. Intentionally, yeah. Yeah. So, well, intentionally, but there are certain powers that are delegated to the House. So, for instance, and, and this is a point of contention, what if it had to do with monetary appropriations? Yeah, and all tax power rests in the um, House. Mm-hmm. Right. At, at least has to start in the House. Right. So if we're, if we're going to argue for, for tax power, maybe we have a situation there where the President and the Senate together never really had the authority to, to, to act in that manner. Okay. So That was an argument that was made against NAFTA at one point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And, and it's going to be made about some other things later on. And then finally, and this is the, the, the most confusing, a treaty provision might be judicially unenforceable because it does not establish a private right of action and there is no other legal basis for the remedy being sought by the party relying on the treaty. Unlike the first three categories of non-self-executing treaties, a treaty that is non-self-executing in the fourth sense will be judicially unenforceable only in certain contexts. These four issues are uh, sufficiently distinct and require sufficiently different analyses that they should be taught as four distinct doctrines. So I want to go back through a little bit that fourth one because there's some confusing terminology in here. It sounds kind of rough. Yeah. The, the first thing it says is a treaty uh, provision might be judicially unenforceable because it does not establish a private right of action. And I actually had to go do research on what's a private right of action. A private right of action is something where a law was made of some kind, usually granting a right. Uh, people have the right to hunt and fish or whatever it is. And there is no other law that grants people the right to sue the federal government, usually the federal government, could be other things, but the federal government, over this action. So if the federal government tried to prevent fishing for some reason, and the people tried to sue the federal government, and the federal government came back and said, whoa, only states can sue us on this because you don't have standing because this was an intrusion on states' rights. So you can't even sue us on your right to hunt yes, and fish. You have no legal standing there. Yeah. Exactly. Yep, I understand that. So if, if there was maybe some kind of congressional law that said people have the right to hunt and fish on their property, the, the court may come through and, and give them what's called private right of standing and say, even though you didn't say that they had the right to sue the federal government over this because you told them they could hunt and fish and then you didn't follow that, you have given them another avenue, which is called private right of standing, to sue you. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I understand that one. Okay, so what they're saying is if, if there is no way, there's no law that says that people or entities can sue the federal government and this treaty doesn't create one of those private rights of standing, it cannot be self-executing uh, because it hasn't given judiciary power to the judiciary. Does that make sense? Sure, sure. Okay. So the, that's the kind of four prong test. But all of those prongs kind of come back to, uh, it, it's interesting, all but one of them comes back to the idea of, is this within the judiciary's power? Let me, let me ask you this. Okay. Does, will, will, will failing one of those tests invalidated or do you have to fail a preponderance of it or do you have to meet all four four failing any one of those tests says that the power does not exist so failing one will say this okay. is a non-self-executing treaty that that makes sense to me okay or at least as this paper reports yeah, yeah. you know um so we, we now have kind of a basis for for uh, uh self-executing treaties if it if it um passes all four of these tests it's self-executing and those actually become really simple because there is a lot of things that we have said cannot be self-executing. We're actually very guarded over what we say can be self-executing. So it, it, it becomes a lot less controversial issue because most of the things that are self-executing have met all of these criteria and, and they're really well fleshed out, we'll say, on what a treaty can do. 
because of that clearness in self-executing treaties, that leaves the other ones, the non-self-executing treaties, and they don't have this the, these these really strict guidelines on what they are. It's kind of everything else. So I want to talk about how non-self-executing treaties uh, have come through, and it's been argued are giving extra constitutional authority, and some would even say, I don't even know the word, against the Constitution, and in opposition to the Constitution, authority to the federal government. So that's yeah, kind yeah. of where we're going to dive now. Yeah, but it actually violates uh, Yes, violates. The Constitution. Yes, yeah, that, yeah. that's a good way to put that. Do we want to talk about this beer before we dive into constitutional violation? Uh, we can. There's actually a whole lot more of, of that to go. Uh, we are 20 minutes in if we want oh, to. Well, time. Oh. well, I mean, if if you know of a, a better place to stop, that's fine. I just, it seemed like a reasonable breaking point. Eh, we can go ahead. I think it's a good time. Okay. Who wants to start on this beer? Hmm. I'll, I'll do it. Okay. okay. I'll do it. Mm. I I like this beer. Um, it, it It's clearly a lager, and lagers aren't my favorite, but it is a flavorful... And complex, I'll say, lager. Um, it, it's got a little bit of citrus in it. Uh, it. It's got a flavor that fills your mouth. Although it's it, it's it's a thinner beer. It's not it's not. I wouldn't even say it's like watery or super thin. It it's got just a, a touch of body to it. It's just With, light. Yes, yeah. it, it, it's light. Um, unfortunately, uh, it, it is a lot of those green or even yellow flavors. Um, uh, almost like a, a a touch of sour weed, if anyone from the South knows what that is. Um, but you don't have a lot of those dark, rich, chocolate, caramel notes that, that, that you get with the kinds of beers I like. There's yeah, not really it's a, a lager. Yeah, there's not a smoky flavor in everything. That said, I think it's a good lager. Um, I'm going to give it a 2.8. Two 2.8? Eight. Two eight. Yeah. All right. Hmm. You or me, Madam Mistress. I'll let you go. All right. Um, I, I also think it's a good lager. It's uh, it's it's got some issues that that, that a lot of lagers have. Uh, I, I hit a beer not too long ago and got hammered for it uh, for, for saying that it was kind of champagne. Yeah. I think this is the same situation. This has got a, this has got a uh, got a kind of carbonation that I'm not crazy about. Um, but I think as far as a, a lager goes, it's it, it's well done. Um, it's not going to be my beer. It's not something that I want to drink a lot. But I, I think this is, you know, on a hot summer day, I think this would be a great beer. I think this would be a good beer at the beach or at, at the lake. It's got that kind of flavor to it. Um, I like your, your explanation of complexity because there is a lot happening in this yeah. beer. Uh, it, it, it's not a simple beer at all. There's there's a, a lot of spicy overtones in there. But they're, they're not, um, you know, they don't jump out and bite you. They're, yeah. they're right there on the backside. I like the fact that it hangs with you when you're done. You can you can still feel it afterwards. Uh, you said that it's a uh, uh, that, that you didn't think it was thin. Uh, I don't think it's watery either, but I do think it's thin. Uh, I think there's a little difference there. Uh, but but again, that that's kind of well, a lager I, for you. I, I think it's on the thinner side. I, I I guess what I was saying is I've had a lot thinner lagers. Sure, sure. And and this doesn't taste thin. For a lager, does yeah. that make yeah. sense? It doesn't. It doesn't taste watery. It, yeah, it's yeah. definitely got a, got a flavor. To, it's got a full flavor. I'm going to say that this is uh, th this is better than a benchmark lager. Um, I I would drink it again, but I wouldn't go out of my way to get it. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go to six. Okay. Okay. Um. So I'll go ahead and get this out of the way. I'm giving it a two two. I I don't dislike it. Um. I don't really note the same complexity that you guys seem to be. Um, and it's even got kind of a... It, it's not a bite and it's not sour that I'm tasting necessarily, but it's, it seems to have something that's kind of clashing on the back end to me that I, I'm not really caring for. I do like the light body of it. Um, I think you're right, Mike, that it would be best on like a, a warm summer day or something yeah. like that. Um, but it's kind of plain to me and I, I'm not really into that. I think that it's a, a good base, but I, f I feel like there's something missing from it. Um, and there's something that's, that's clashing in it that I can't quite identify. Um, so that's why it gets a two, two, which it's, 
is because it's not a bad beer per se. Um, I just think it could do a little better. And I, I I think that's fair. I think, but I, I think what's missing about it is that it's it's not a stout. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> that's kind yeah. of I, the, the situation I run yeah. into with it is, you know, it's this is I would say this is probably nobody on this show's choice beer, but if you had to have a lager, it's it's, it's not a bad one to go with. So it's are like you? It's gonna... not particularly anything. It's not particularly crisp. It's not particularly refreshing. It's not particularly flavorful. I find um, it. I, I find it. Very refreshing. I, 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 I'm catching that on there, uh, and I, I like the flavors. And, and you talk about the back end. Uh, there is a there is a bitter bite on the back end, mm -hmm. but I like it. Uh, I, I think I think that's part of what gives this the good flavor. And I, you know, that just comes down to personal taste and mm -hmm. and, and, and what you want. Uh, I'll say that a year ago I probably would have hammered this a little bit worse than I do mm -hmm. now. But uh, you know, just changing flavors. I think that if this beer were a uh, patron at a club, it would not be anybody that you noticed. It would be some very unassuming person who is probably not out on the dance floor, but isn't like hiding in a corner in the super creepy kid or something. But it wouldn't be the one that you waited till two o'clock with last call to take home either. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but it would literally be the one that you just didn't notice. Yeah. So is it a lawnmower beer? Uh, yeah, I think it's a lawnmower beer. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 there are better lawnmower beers because it's a little heavier than, uh, or a little, a little uh, fuller than most lawnmower beers. But yeah, yeah, I think it's a lawnmower beer. Yeah, as far as which date, honestly, it's, it's not going to be in my date repertoire. I, I'm not going to take it on a date. Uh, this might be a good one to take to the uh, to the the low grade club to pick up a Bud Light girl. I think she'll be very impressed. But it's a lager. I mean, and that's not a knock on this lager. It's more commentary <laughs> on Definitely lagers. better than a Bud Light. <laughs> yes. Definitely better than a Bud Light. It's great for taking home a Bud Light girl. Yeah. Is it going to get you laid? Uh, no. In fact, I think this is a fantastic beer if you want to have a forgettable evening so that you can <laughs> not have to have that awkward breakup conversation. It's funny. Uh, we we, we kind of put it in the middle on our rating, and then we just knocked it on the back end. Yeah, yeah. It's just... Uh... Again, it I, just doesn't it, it's have. Just, have it's a lager. It's, it's just lager. not. It's just not this audience's beer. Yeah, I yeah. think a lager. I, I think if you're a big lager fan, you'll like this beer. Yeah, I, th I think so. But you know, I don't. <laughs> if you're a lager fan, let, let us, us know. know. Yeah. yeah, I I want to know what somebody who loves lagers. <laughs> if you're a lager fan, thinks. you probably don't like the mistress either, though. So it all kind of works out. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so back to our discussion. Where are we in this? Uh, uh, quagmire that you've got got us drug into yeah so so great now word. you yeah, like that it word was, yeah it was we're about to see some more great words don't don't worry um is higgledy biggledy in there it no should be. damn it yeah that 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 particular justice is dead now so i, th I think that word died with, with scalia we shouldn't let that happen we shouldn't let that happen let the le legacy live right let the legacy yes, li la yeah. yes. yes. let the legacy live <laughs> let the let the liquors live gotcha <laughs> All right, that just that, evolved. That's liquor. <laughs> that was liquors with a Q, in yeah. case you were wondering. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, or a CK. So, so now we've kind of gotten through three of the four, and 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 this last one is is going to be where we're going to see most of the controversy on power with non self executing treaties. And and quick review: those are treaties that are made as agreement to between two countries, but then Congress has to come back and act in order for them to be law. So, let's first talk, because we're going to build a, a little brick house here that's going to, to lead to, to the, the controversy here. Let's first talk about limitations on, on, on uh, the powers of treaties. Uh, we're going to start with the president. Uh, there are critical limits on, and this is from the uh, Harvard Law uh, um, uh, paper, Limits on the Treaty Power. And to give a little background, at the time that this was written, there was a, a really big case before the SCOTUS, uh, Bond versus United States, and uh, they were they were in the middle of a case, and we'll dive into the details of it a little bit later. But more or less, it, it's it's going to be it's been ruled on now, but it's going to be instrumental in the way that we treat the treaty power moving forward. So. This article is meant to be a persuasive piece on how that should be ruled on, um, not necessarily how it was ruled on. So, uh, quoting the article, there are critical limits on the president's power to make treaties. One, two-thirds of the Senate must approve the treaty. 
Seems pretty straightforward. Two, the treaty cannot violate an independent con constitutional bar. I want to stop for a minute. I had to look up what a constitutional bar is. Any anyone got a got a clue on a constitutional bar? Constitutional bar where SCOTUS goes. Limitation. Yeah. So oh. it's it, it's it's an explicit thing that the Constitution says you cannot do this. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You can't make a treaty uh, a treaty between two nations allowing slavery because slavery is barred by the Constitution. Right. Yeah. Right. Or it's the bar where SCOTUS goes. Or it's the bar where SCOTUS goes. Yes. The the the. I the, want to go to that bar. I'm just saying. The, yeah. the independent constitutional bar. We should make that. I got a, I, I, I got a feeling that, uh, that, that a couple of those guys can drink. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know who drinks them all under the table? Notorious RBG. I'm sorry, RBG. <laughs> Notorious RBG. <laughs> She's got to be awake, though. <laughs> no. <laughs> she does not. Why do you think she sleeps through all the hearings? Exactly. She's just passed out. She's 400 years old, too. So Also that. So, uh, number three, the treaty cannot uh, disrupt our constitutional structure by giving away sovereignty reserved to the states. Um, and, and we're going to see some of that played with here later. Can't violate the Ninth or Tenth Amendments, basically. Well, that's, that's what they're arguing. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, he, here's here's a, a, a piece kind of supporting all this. Uh, it says, Afford justice plurality acknowledge this principle in Reed v. Convert, holding that treaties authorizing military commission trials of American citizens abroad on military bases could not displace Fifth and Sixth Amendment cr criminal proceeding, procedure rights. Justice Black, joined by Justice Ch uh, by Chief Justice Warren, Justice Douglas, and Je Justice Bennon, uh, were who recognized this? Uh, Warren, yeah, fucking Warren Court. Go ahead. <laughs> so, so basically, uh, uh, not crazy about the Warren Court. I know. Yeah. So basically, it was the same principle you said about, about yeah. the Tenth Amendment, but it was it was applying to the Fifth and Sixth Amendment. Yeah. yeah. Um, quoting a, again the article: uh, No agreement with a foreign nation can confer power on the Congress or any other branch of government which is free from the restraints of the Constitution. And then uh, going into a... Uh, Read that again. Okay. No agreement with a foreign nation can confer power on the Congress or on any other branch of government which is free from the restraints of the Constitution. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, reading another section. There is nothing in Article 5... Art, sorry. Article 6, the Supremacy Clause, which intimates that treaties and laws enacted pursuant to them do not have to comply with the provisions of the Constitution. It would be manifestly contrary to the objectives of those who created the Constitution, as well as those who were responsible for the Bill of Rights, let alone alien to our entire constitutional history and tradition, to uh, construe Article 6 as permitting the United States to exercise power under an international agreement without observing constitutional prohibitions. In effect, such con construction would permit uh, amendment of that document in a manner not sanctioned by Article 5. The prohibitions of the Constitution were designed to apply to all branches of the national government, and they cannot be nullified by the executive or by the executive and Senate combined. I have an issue here. Okay. That's that I, I, I'm in a bad place because I completely agree with the principles that he said there. I completely agree. Mm -hmm. And I also think it's constitutionally wrong. Okay. I agree with the principles that you, that, 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 that if I understand this correctly, yeah. that a treaty can't, uh, can't be in violation of, of the other rights of the Constitution. But he talks about in there how the supremacy clause uh, 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 is where he finds that. I don't think you can find that there. I think uh, I, I think it's a it's a fundamental misunderstanding where the document does say that a, that a, a treaty can, in fact, uh, uh, be in violation of the Constitution. So it's a weird situation where I, I I'm, I'm glad they said this, but I don't think they were right. Well, yeah. and and what he's uh, what he's arguing here, and I may have some notes on this further along. So if if we end up repeating ourselves, that I think it bears report, repeating anyway. That's just so, our chef. Yeah, but uh, what he's saying here is the Constitution says. You can make treaties, and they're the supreme law of the land. In fact, it says you can make laws, yeah, yeah. and the laws are the supreme law of the land. The Constitution also says that you cannot— that The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Well, and, and beyond that, the, the Constitution says that you can't uh, search somebody without a warrant or probable cause, right? 
So how do you go in there and say the Constitution says you can make these treaties out of the supreme law of the land, and the Constitution says you can't search people without due do, do cause and, and, and process? So I'm going to arbitrarily choose this side to, to agree with. I mean, how, how do you come to that? Yeah, I think I think that's the issue that they run to is you have a document there that is uh, uh, that has vagaries in it. Yes. Um, but but I, I again, I, I think that the principle is right that they say, look, just as an example that let's say we entered into a treaty that says, uh, you know, that you can you can tap phones. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that sounds so bizarre that you could tap phones, but we entered this treaty that says this, this kind of thing, but the constitution says you can't do it without a warrant. Well, I think the principle is right that, that, you know, that you can't enter in something because it violates your constitutional rights, but the principle is not, it's not the law that's written. I think the law that is written says that the, that the treaty, uh, uh, it, it is higher than, than the original document. Um, it, which is bizarre because it violates other places too because you're essentially amending the the, the constitution without going through the amending process. Right. Yeah, well and, and I have to I have to ask and, and this is something I have to ask myself so I'm I'm glad you're 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 bringing it forward. If you argue that if you argue that that article 6, the supremacy clause, yep. says that because it says supreme that it 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 can amend the constitution that same article says the laws are supreme so how can you then not argue that a simple law can't supersede the constitution yeah that's that, that, I, I, the vagaries there are tough they're 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 hard to come by uh i i would have to go back and look at it uh and and trying to stay true to myself i'm putting myself in, a, in the position of a uh, of a, a jurist if i was here uh, and, and I would like, have to look at preferred position there and see uh, see see where they are. Well, and they, they do a lot. In fact, a, a preferred position is actually some of the argument they've used for saying that the ten rights, the, yeah. the ten amendments, is actually more than ten rights, but the t the first ten amendments, first ten amendments, have preferred position, and therefore you cannot and, violate those. Well, except the first ten amendments are 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 actually amended after the supremacy clause was put into place. Well, the, the, so so what has preferred position? The supremacy clause of the amendments. Well, and and so I think the thing that could be argued here cuz um that was an amendment to the constitution when it yeah. was done, right? And, and an amendment trumps the original document otherwise slavery would still be legal. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 exactly. And so, women wouldn't be voting. Exactly. So Never that, mind, I've changed my mind. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> Just about the women. Just about the women. Our options are either that I can vote or I can go on a killing spree as I get to the voting booth to do it anyway. What do you want? Can we you're have not, both? You're not in my precinct, so I'm not worried about it. <laughs> Maybe I want to vote in your precinct. I'm kidding. I won't go on a killing spree, but I might poison you. Uh, well, the love um, in this room. Yeah. <laughs> well, and and, and I, I I I do understand that that, that you have reservations uh, yeah. about the supremacy clause and what supremacy means and, and what they're using it here, uh, but that's not actually um, the the controversy among the uh, the 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 legal community. The people that are a lot smarter than me. Yeah. Right. Here's what their controversy is. All right. Their controversy is around subject matter based limitations. Another fun phrase. Yeah. Um. And, and I read here, I'm going to actually read uh, uh, two things. I'm going to read the text and then a, 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 an example of this. The treaty power contains no subject matter-based limitations. This is the predominant view in the legal academy, that there are essentially no other subject matter limits on the president's power to make treaties. So that's m more or less saying, while a treaty cannot violate the Constitution, something explicit, a uh, 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 constitutional bar, it can create extra constitutional powers. Yeah, yeah. And an example of this is on a, a case that was done on a treaty with Canada over migratory birds called Missouri v. Holland. Did the birds sign the treaty? Uh, no, that they actually were not were not participants. Uh, okay. Um, and, and and it had to do with with the hunting of these birds uh, they were endangered and 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 part of the argument is we, we can make this with Canada because the birds. So, so it's kind of like the Versailles Treaty at the end of World War One, where we didn't let Germany have anything to do with it. I, I don't know. Now we'll talk about okay, that some other time. Cool. Um, Justice Holmes phrased the uh, phrased the question presented with evident disdain as. 
the treaty in question does not uh, contravene. There's an, a word. So the treaty in question does not contravene any prohibitory word to be found in the Constitution. The only question is whether it is forbidden by some invisible radiation from the general terms of the Tenth Amendment. I love Oliver Wendell Holmes. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. He's a genius. Well, he, he apparently thinks that the... Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this. I don't thing. always agree with him, but I love the way he, 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 he says things. You yeah. Know? He's eloquent. He, he, the, the invisible radiation from the general <laughs> terms of the Tenth Amendment. Yeah, yeah. Later on, we're going to find some other uh, uh, kind of um, uh, less than favorable wording toward the uh, Tenth yeah, Amendment. Yeah, yeah. But, he, he was not a fan. But more or less, uh, uh, what he's getting at here is that is that we can do anything with treaties that the Constitution doesn't explicitly say we can do because it's the supreme law of land. We can't violate existing things. You can't violate the law, but you can take powers that are not limited. Or, yes. or that are not specifically. Yeah. And, and the big argument about this is like, but those powers were, were enumerated and reserved to the states. And he says, eh. He's very much an expressed powers uh, person. He, 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 he saw the delegated powers as, as being much more important than the implied powers. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that's his, his scathing review of the 10th amendment. Yeah. yeah. By the way, uh, that, 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 uh, uh, ruling that he gave was not very controversial. It was upheld seven to two, so it, it wasn't even like it was. It was yeah. Nope. It wasn't some partisan thing. Yeah. No, nobody had the balls to argue with Oliver Wendell Holmes when he was uh, was on the court. Only two did. I don't yeah. know who they are. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes ran that ran that system. Yeah. Mo uh, 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 moving forward along the same line of reasoning, Justice Holmes reasoned that it is obvious that there may be matters of the sharpest. Exigency, that was a new word for me, uh, for the national well-being that an act of Congress could not deal with, but that a treaty followed by such an act could. So what he's saying here is that treaties, and this gets into that self-executing, non-self-executing thing, a treaty cannot just go through and do whatever it wants. It can't grant extra powers. Partially because it does cut out the house. It, it, it cuts out a lot of pieces there. But a treaty can grant power to Congress to make a law for which it maybe couldn't before. And once that treaty is there, it gives them the power to. They can then make the legislation that fulfills that treaty that they couldn't have made before the treaty was there. Okay, so it's a way of granting more authority. It's a way of growing the power of the legislative branch. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. You can grow the power of the legislative and branch. And the executive branch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they have to actually go through and make those laws. They have to do it. But this can give them the... the, the this can move the boundary back for them to actually have that power to do sure, it. Sure, because you establish a precedent. And from that, you know, once you've, once you've done it, you've got a precedent to do it again. Yeah. Marbury v. Madison. Yeah. The real slippery slope. Fuck them. Yeah, of course. Without Marbury v. Madison, uh, we wouldn't even have the court here to say we can do this little. That 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 that's true. That's true. It was still fucked up. Yeah, it was still fucked up. Yeah, and you know that's the fucked up part about this is is all this argument I'm hearing of of con and, and and blatantly arguing Congress can go through and use this to take extra constitutional powers and 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 usurp them is the restraint argument. <laughs> this is the let's not do as much bad shit argument. That's pretty sad. That's pretty yeah. sad. All right. Uh, we so, don't really have a limited government. So I, I, just, I just want to point that out. I know I teach, I, I teach every year the, you know, the, the seven <laughs> principles of the Constitution and limited government is always, we don't have a limited government anymore. Yeah. They do whatever the hell they want to do. Yeah. Was it ever limited? Well, let's get to that. Because I want to, I want to talk here about about a lot of much older case law that kind of rebuts this idea. Uh, starting with, uh, and this isn't case law, this is just a quote, but Jefferson's rebut. So Thomas Jefferson uh, explained in the the treaty explained the treaty power must have meant to accept the rights reserved to the states, for surely the president and senate cannot do by treaty what the whole government is in interdicted from doing in any way so the, right. so the whole government's barred from doing this how can the the president and the senate suddenly do what what the government can't do at all i like jefferson more now see elastic clause 
Yeah, well, and, and that's where that's where a lot of this comes from. Is I know. is is re- usurped under the elastic clause. Yep. Stretched from sea to sea, right? Yeah. yeah. As early as 1836, the court explained, Congress cannot by legislation enlarge the federal jurisdiction, nor can it be enlarged under the treaty-making power. Uh, on, in 1872, the court expanded on this point. The framers of the Constitution intended that the treaty power should extend to all of those objects which in the intercourse of nations had usually been regarded as the proper subject of negotiation and treaty. If not inconsistent with the nature of our government and the relation between the states and the United States. So that, that last part's important, and I kind of screwed up. I'm going to say it again. If not inconsistent with the nature of our government and the relation between the states and the United States. So I think that's very clear. Uh, the Constitution sets up our government, sets up these boundaries between state rights and, and federal rights. Federalism. Yeah. And by this, the treaty powers have a lot of power, but not there. What do you think of that? Yeah, they have power between the national government and foreign governments, but not. Uh, but but they can't. Uh, um, my, my my brain isn't working. They they can't violate the uh, the limitations between the, the state and the federal government. Yeah. 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 Well, and and based but on the didn't. based on the original idea that each of these states was going to be a government. Of its own, yeah, thirteen independent states. Now yeah. that was under the Articles. That you know, by the time the Constitution came along, that was that was gone. Right, um, but I think you can see some remnants here. Yeah, of the idea that the states were meant to be independent governments, that this kind of coalition government um, was not able to supersede. I, I I think that was what they intended. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it didn't turn out that way, but I yeah. think that's what they intended. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm going to go through uh, uh, one more early case law along the same line, and then I want to stop. I want to come kind of off script here, and I want to talk about some problematic things with um, this idea of not letting the federal government play with this line between states' rights and federal rights. All right, so, so, so the next one... Uh, Another case of early case law, it has been argued by some that the reserved power to the states is a check on Congress power. In fact, the Supreme Court recognized this structural argument favoring limits on Congress's power to implement treaties long before Missouri v. Holland. In 1836, the court explained, the government of the United States is one of limited powers. It can exercise authority over no subjects except those which have been delegated to it. Congress cannot by legislation enlarge the federal jurisdiction, nor can it be enlarged under the treaty-making powers. A few years later, Justice Story, writing for the Supreme Court, reasoned that the Necessary and Proper Clause did not give Congress carte blanche power to implement treaties. Although the power is given to the executive with the consent of the Senate to make treaties, the power is... Nowhere in positive terms conferred upon Congress to make laws to carry uh, the stipulations of treaties into effect. So what he's what he's arguing there and, and, and what is actually argued in, in much more depth in this article, because of, of Missouri v. Holland and, and this Byrd Treaty, so that, that case went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court are, uh, uh, actually kind of sided with the the people on that one um or or, sorry the supreme court sided with the federal government on that one but in a way that didn't give explicit answers let let me say that um so what it had to do with is as a person hunting these migratory birds and uh they went and they, they they sued saying well the, the federal government didn't have uh, a right to make this this const- this this treaty uh, because it violated states' rights, and the court came back. Uh, the Third Circuit uh, was was going to uh, side with the federal government on this one, and actually uh, dismissed the case um, uh, uh, altogether. And what the the Supreme Court said uh, is that. He he does have the 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 president does have the power to make this this treaty. 
It, there's nothing wrong with the treaty. Um, but then left it at that. They didn't, they didn't make rulings on, on the rightness of the law that was made. It was a non-self-executing treaty, and there was a law made. They didn't make any, any rulings on the law. They just said, we can, th they can make a treaty. There's nothing wrong with this treaty. Move along. Now, what the writer of this article has argued is that the courts were absolutely right in their ruling. That the president and the Senate can make a treaty. But they're arguing that the president and the Senate have the right to lie. That the president can go and make a treaty with another country, and the Senate can confirm that treaty. But that does not then obligate Congress to follow through with the law. And their reasoning is, for a law to be made, the House of Representatives has to approve it. And there is no possible way that the president can know that it will pass the House of Representatives. So if the House of Representatives is needed to approve this, there's no possible way that we can say that because a non-self-executing treaty was made that it has to be done because the House of Representatives could come through and say no on the legal part, right? So because of this, we can then, then look into that and say, well, since the president can't know that any given law is going to go into law, uh, he could... Make he could make treaties that are improbable. He could make a treaty that that highly favors Republican uh, ideals with a a hugely Democratic controlled House, thinking that it was never going to go through. Now we can ask whether it was a smart idea for him to make that treaty, knowing that it probably wouldn't go through. And we can even go so far as to say that he can make a a a, a treaty where there's some constitutional question about whether or not that could happen. Once it hits Congress, and that's all well and good. But that does not then, once the treaty is made, confer on Congress the power to make any law it wants because there was a treaty involved. Yeah, we've actually had presidents use that tool where they've gone through and, and, and entered into an agreement, made a treaty in order to save face with a nation, knowing that it's not going to, uh, it's not going to get through Congress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, so it allows them to uh, it allows them to ally with somebody to, to build themselves up as a, as a friend of a, of a nation and know that they're not really going to have to follow it. Yeah. yeah well, and, and we we can look at we can look at a mutual protection pact of some kind. Sure. We can sign that, and then something happens that the other country we're in a protection pact with decides to be an asshole and goes to war with a country that that's we're also friendly to. Does that then compel Congress to make a declaration of war because the president and Senate decided yeah. it was a good idea ten years ago? Let's say you know. Yeah. And 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 so the the argument made here was that yes, the Supreme Court's right; they can make that treaty. But they can do it because they're allowed to lie. And even though they never had the power to enforce it, that lie is still fine. Yeah, and the rest of the world still recognizes it as a uh, as, as law. Yeah, and we may have to deal with fallout because of this. It may be a bad idea to do. And sometimes fallout on international courts. Yeah, but that doesn't make it, it – it doesn't play with the legal boundaries of Congress. That's right. Okay. Um, so – uh, I have I have a note here that this is is actually um, this is this is something that that the courts have have talk called talking about Tenth Amendment because a lot of this oh we're going to go off script here uh, talking about about the Tenth Amendment because um, it, it, it so enraged me um, they argue that the Tenth Amendment was a truism in United States v Darby okay. So a, a truism, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, is, is something stated that doesn't really add any information. It was obviously true, right? And so in arguing that the Tenth Amendment was a truism, what they're indeed arguing is that, of course, any power that the federal government ha didn't have was always at the states. It, it didn't need to be said. It was always there. But that in no way restricts what power the federal government can grab. It's not a restriction on the federal government in any means. It was just they were saying this constitution is written on paper. It's an ink blot at the end yeah. of the of the whole thing. Yeah, which is what Madison was afraid of whenever they wrote it down. That's what he was one of the things he warned against. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I I, I kind of skipped off there, going off script and, and and talking about why this might be problematic, saying that that Congress cannot usurp any power not granted it. The Constitution states that the um, federal government cannot usurp land from states. We can't take Texas and say you're four states now without the state's approval. Without the state's approval, that's right. We can't give Texas to California, yada. The states are, are sovereign. Cannot adjust the boundaries, yeah. Right. 
So what happens when we when Mexico becomes much more powerful in the future and we go to war with Mexico and they say, all right, we're willing to stop slaughtering your people and coming through and destroying you, but we need Texas and California back. Can the federal government give away Texas and California as as a simple land transaction as as part of a peace treaty? Legally, no. They would have to get so powerful for us to do that. Sorry. Well, it's it's not the point of what. Yeah, no, it's a know. hypothetical. I've just yeah. be a big deal. Well, I mean, we've done it before. Yeah, we we have. Uh, we, we we can also talk about uh, uh, resources. Uh, g- giving giving. Uh, resources away i mean if if they're not being traded across states aren't those the resources of the state if they're owned by the state or the federal i don't know ask that one again if there's a resource let's say uh uh because because the the federal government does have some power under the interstate commerce clause right yeah but if texas has oil under its ground that's texas's oil right or am I misunderstanding something here? No, yeah, it is. It is unless it's on unless it's on federal land. Yes, right. So Texas has oil. Boom. Can we trade that oil as part of a? a we being a, the U.S. Yeah, uh, I, I would say that 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 right now no, but the court has ruled that the federal government can take the uh, offshore oil, and they have in a lot of places. In fact, Texas is I, I, if they're not still, I know they were in a lawsuit against the federal government trying to keep control of our offshore oil. Because they were they were trying to, uh, to to restrict it. Yeah. So these these are the kind of questions you, you you run into under current legal understanding. And part of the problem is there's so little the SCOTUS has ruled on. But Thank we God. Can, we can look at the rulings and see the leanings of the court. I'll say. Well, and the, the leanings, given court. the leanings of the, yeah the given court. Every court seems to be different. Well, that they do, but the differences from one court to another seem minute. Depends on the court. Okay. And it depends the issue. on the court and the issue. I mean, th- th- we've had we've had complete turnarounds from w- w- with you know with a change in chief justice on, yeah. on several occasions. Well, um, but if we look at the leanings of the current court and the and, and the the um, current current court is leaning towards national uh, power over state power. Well, and, and, and not just the, the, just that, but but the precedent yeah. of of recent history sure, courts. Sure. Uh, the leanings would tend to suggest to to most scholars that uh, the federal government does have the right to give away land in, in that situation. Now, one thing that's been argued in this article is that maybe uh, there's there's some narrow window under which that could happen. He actually proposed the idea that we could only do it for for a war treaty under those narrow circumstances, and only once Congress has declared war. And and his argument there is, once that's happened, you have now involved the House, the Senate, and the President in this decision because the war was declared, and now we're talking about a peace treaty within this. Um, and he 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 argues that as like a secondary position, of like if this power does exist, maybe it exists. Under these narrow terms, but he he then more goes on to more broadly argue that he doesn't even think that power exists. If that power existed, it may exist there, but he thinks that the state would have to be involved. But that becomes really problematic because you have a situation now where you could be looking at the the loss of life of people in in thirty other states over over the the stubbornness of one. Right now, does that state have the right to be that stubborn and, and cost the other state? states those lives that's a really hard question damn right it does states right superior but uh but 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 i don't don't think the court agrees yeah i don't think the court agrees and i i think the court would probably make that interpretation uh you know in times of war that all all the rules go out the window in times of war yeah it's just just the way it is um unfortunately yeah hell we didn't have to go to war for patriot act to, to, to change everything uh, so, well, and and you know you get into the same vein of of, of strangeness that you get into whenever a state comes through and says uh, you can't be licensed for X, you can't be licensed to I don't know perform abortions in the state. Let's say that they made that rule, and then we have this this rule in the Constitution that says any document issued by one state yeah. is 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 recognized by another. So. Can I go over to Louisiana, get my license to do that, and then come back over here and, and, and have fun and do what I want? 
you can your your license is recognized to practice, but you the, your, but the practice of it is illegal. Okay. Well, wh- what about uh, so you can be called doctor and you're licensed to do it. You're just you just the action is not legal in the state. Okay. Let's look at one that that's that's that that's recently come to a head and and, and been resolved by by the Supreme Court. Gay marriage. Yeah. yeah, that's 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 come out that 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 legal contract is is legal in all fifty states. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. Uh, that that's that's been determined. Yeah, I think. Yeah, it's a little different situation though. Yeah, it it is because yeah. there there's some legal contracts, and and we could even even look at let's look at something a little more controversial, polygamy, right? If one state said, well, you you can have polygamy marriages, and because it's a marriage, you you now have a bunch of rights conferred with it, talking about a, a, a right to. A, a, Determine what happens in medical situations. I forget the wording for it. Um, yeah. For uh, right of attorney, uh, uh, inheritance rights, all these other insurance rights, all these other rights that come with marriage. And then, uh, you know, five people go and get married in, in Montana and then move to Texas. Does Texas have to recognize that marriage and then confer rights upon that? I think the president would say yes. I, I agree. Yeah. I, I, I think you're right. I think the president would have to say yes. Yeah. So. Five years ago, I would have said no. Yeah. So, what do you think the Constitution says? You, you talked about the precedent. I think the Constitution says yes. I, I, I think you have to recognize legal contracts from all states. Um, that's not exactly the same thing as a treaty, though. It's a little different. Mm-hmm. It is. It is. But it does talk about the the ability for power from one section to bleed into to yeah. the rights of another. Yeah. I mean, and and, and it's a, it's a constant struggle that we've fought with both between states and the federal government and between states. My, my whole problem with the treaty power is uh, I, I'll take the treaty power serious when the federal government starts taking the treaty power serious and uh, uh, honors some of the treaties the, the treaties we've made with Indian nations over the last couple hundred years. Well, and the, and that's a great point. You know, the the whole thing that sparked this show is we were doing our our, our show on torture a couple weeks back. And and I mentioned that you know we, we, you you were talking about was it Geneva Convention yeah uh, and and how I, I made the the statement that I've I made before of of you know this Trump's Constitution didn't seem like that's quite right now but it seems like within the the constraints of the Geneva Convention it, it completely had authority right yeah, yeah. Uh, after reading this um, and we've ignored it. We've ignored it for our, for our own gain, and then all of a sudden, when we want to do something, We've ignored lots of treaties. Yeah, yeah. When we want to do something that 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 seems you know beneficial to to the current federal government, all of a sudden this treaty power becomes a really important thing that we need to argue for, and we ignore it when, when it's convenient. So I do agree that that there, that is problematic. We need to to pick a road and stick on it. It's either it's either this hugely powerful thing, or it's 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 a very weak thing. It's a stick that the government can use when they need it. Yeah. I, I want to talk about the the results real quick and and the case itself because because we kind of danced around the arguments on this Bond v United States. We never got into what was Bond v United States. So there was this treaty. Uh, the treaty had to do with chemical weapons, the banning of chemical weapons, and uh, there were actually a, a bunch of elements to to that were problematic for this case. One. The treaty itself had to do with uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction and chemical weapons used between states. And not states like we're saying Texas and Louisiana, but like governments. Nations, yeah. Nations, yes. So it was, it was, it was chemical weapons between states. It was a non-self-executing treaty that uh, was trying to work its way toward uh, uh, destroying and, and not creating uh, these kinds of chemical weapons anymore. Congress came through and made a law because of this non-self-executing treaty, uh, banning very broadly the use of all chemicals that could be harmful to life uh, or, or humans with a few exceptions baked in. Medical use, agricultural use, blah, blah, blah. All right. So this woman finds out that her neighbor is pregnant with her husband's baby. And a fight ensues, as you can imagine. And throughout the longevity of this fight, this woman works at a place that apparently has access to chemicals. And she decides to grab a couple of chemicals, mix them together, and coats the woman's mailbox and car door handle in these chemicals, resulting in her uh, receiving chemical burns on her hands. Um, 
later on, now this could easily have been prosecuted under state law, under assault, aggravated assault, any number of state laws, but the way they decide to prosecute it is under the law that came from this chemical weapons treaty. And the arguments being made here were, um, one, was there standing to ever make that treaty? Two, the Congress made laws that were much narrower and seemed to be outside the scope of the intention of the treaty itself. And three, did the making of those laws usurp state's uh, uh, police power to come in and prosecute her under federal law? So, th three points here. Um, and so, what, what are your thoughts on, on those three? I know I didn't give a lot of details about the law, but I think I gave some of the key points here. Uh, without knowing exactly what the treaty was, was supposed to go, I, I have a hard time comp commenting on whether the Congress, uh, you know, made a law that was, in, you know, that was, yeah. that was, that was beyond that. If they in fact made a law that was beyond the scope of the treaty, I think the laws it, it, it is, is null and void. I think it gets thrown out because they took that power from a treaty, um, you know, and if if you you know, if you expand that power, then then you're 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 violating your your standing. Any other thoughts on that? No. All right. So so the, this case never ruled on. So here's the results of Bond v. United States. The SCOTUS ruled that individuals do have standing to make structural arguments about individual rights and powers reserved to the people. So an important case. The Third Circuit Court threw out her case, saying you don't even have standing. In this in this case, uh, because the state was the ones whose power was usurped, so when it went to and and she actually ended up in that case pleading guilty on the grounds that she was allowed to uh, uh, take this one to the Supreme Court and argue it there, but I guess she got a lesser sentence if she pled guilty at that point. So so it went to the SCOTUS. The SCOTUS uh, 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 ruled that she did have standing. The people could could uh, sue in this kind of case. But remanded the case back to the Cir Third Circuit Court, which validated the treaty. The, so, so that it, it kind of felt like they didn't make any ruling on the well, treaty. They made a ruling on one part. They made a ruling that you have standing, and then threw it back and said, "Now you got to listen to the case." Yeah, and it, it really feels like a cop out because there are a bunch of unanswered questions in this. The SCOTUS refused to address any of those questions, and then threw it back to a court that that was fairly clear how that court was going to rule. It almost seems like, and I think we've seen this many times in our court, they were like, "Yeah, I think there's some problems here, but I don't want to let you off the hook. You you did something bad. I'm gonna in in the the the." least restrictive way possible. I'm going to rule on what I have to, and then I'm going to throw you back to the sharks. I think the court did what they were supposed to do here. You do? I think, the, you know, if you accept, if you accept the fact that the court has the right uh, to, to rule an act of uh, uh, Congress unconstitutional or, or something, if you accept that, and I think we have to at this point, it, you know, it's been the standard yeah. since 1803, then uh, I think the court said, they looked at it and they said, look, my job is to rule on constitutional issues. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here to determine right and wrong. I'm here to say, is this in the Constitution? They read it. They said, look, yes, she has standing. This is the argument that was done. I'm going to throw it back and I'm going to let the court make a decision. Now, if the court makes a bad decision, you can then uh, bring it back to the Supreme Court again. The court can do something else. Yeah, because that's what she was appealing when it went to the Supreme Court the first time was the act of throwing it out on the basis that she yeah. didn't have standing. So that's all that they should have ruled on. Yeah. If they had ruled on anything else... It would have been an it, excess of authority. Exactly. Yeah. And so that was absolutely the right thing that should have been done according to the structure. And, and I think you're absolutely right, Mike, that... Then, and I, I think you can safely say that the the Third Circuit was was going to not rule in her favor on that. But then, but, but the court's job, the Supreme Court's job, is not to determine right and wrong in individual cases. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court's job is to interpret yeah. whether or not the court, uh, the lower courts, are acting within the law. Right. Yeah. So. So, with that, I mean, that's that's really everything I had here. I guess the one thing that I do need to correct myself in previous episodes, when I said that the treaties have higher power than the Constitution, it has equal standing with the Constitution, usually. 
Seemingly, yeah. maybe. I, 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 I think. I think it probably still has higher power. Just, it, I think it has de facto higher power, if not de jure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, legally, does it have higher power? I don't. I, I, I mean, that, that, domestically, that, you know, that's real. That's real fuzzy. I think the, yeah. uh, the supremacy clause kind of kind of says it does, but de facto. I think our I think our, our government acts as if the treaties have have supremacy over it. It, it definitely seems to care about them a lot yeah, more than yeah. it, well. I say that, but then we just talked about the torture treaty yeah. that it kind of ignored. Yeah, but again, in most cases, I think I, I, you know uh, NAFTA, CAFTA, uh, uh, the, the the way we we deal with things in the high seas, maritime law. Those are all treaties that that definitely have higher uh, standing than. It, than it almost seems like we're saying. Um, is, is a treaty higher than the Constitution? Well, which one? Well, this one. How many bombs do they have, and how much business do we do with them? I, I, I think I think a, a a very accurate thing Maybe would be to so. say that treaties have higher bearing with the Constitution outside of the borders of the United States, oh, but for not sure. inside. So for you know, sure. Uh, Although we we saw the case earlier where did, the where the Constitution trumped it, and and they were talking about prosecuting people on, on military base, and they said, nope, they have Fifth Amendment rights, which is. Freaking bizarre since the UCMJ uh, uh, trumps the uh, Constitution for our, our military guys. Well, but, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's freaking bizarre. Freaking war in court. All right. Yeah. Um, this was interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we got back into some, some deep constitutional stuff here. And my brain hurts. Yeah. Hey, guys. Six-pack philosophy here. I know we're kind of interjected into our own show. Kind of a weird thing there. Yeah, we kind of messed up, didn't we? Yeah, we did. We forgot something important. Yeah. We have a new thing we're doing, and uh, we're supposed to give you another podcast or YouTube channel or something to. Yeah, if you have to go somewhere, go here, kind of thing. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. So, Mike, I think it's your turn this week. Yeah, I, 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 this was a tough one. I'm going to go with Dan Carlin's Common Sense. Uh, Dan Carlin is a, a, a podcast that's been around for a long time. He does really long podcasts, and Common Sense is uh, it, it, it's incredible. Each episode is like an audio book in itself. Uh, so, so check it out. They don't come out real regular, uh, but when you get on, you're going to get to get to experience a, a, a lot of detail about a lot of really great in-depth history ideas. So uh, check it out. All right. Sounds good. Well, let's get back to the uh, last little bit of the show. Let's do it. So, D uh, Does anyone have anything to add here? I know that most of the episode was just me like rambling on about three days worth of hard research I've yeah, done. Yeah, it's, it, it's just a, it's a tough topic. It really is. And I think there's an audience for it. I'm not sure what the audience is. So I hope yeah. if you're still listening, you're our audience. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, this, this, was a, this was a lot of fun. We're going to go look at, um, at, at on the Hard Shot feed, yeah. we're going to look at a little bit of international law. It'll be a little shorter look at this, but we're going to look at, uh, you know, what rights do ambassadors have and, and, and stuff like that and, and, and kind of take a little, little different look. You know, the Hard Shot feed is kind of our playground where we do yeah. things that don't exactly fit. And we don't figure you want to listen to another hour of, uh, of this topic. So. Yeah. And if, if you want to get Hard Shots now, Hard Shots is no longer come out of the podcast feed. In fact, if you have the podcast feed, it will be blank for the next year. Uh, we are putting them up on YouTube. Uh, we will probably release them. We're, we're going to release the YouTube videos and the podcasts uh, in a year. So if you want to wait a year, you can get this. If you don't want to wait a year, you can go to patreon.com slash sixpackphilosophy. $10 a month gets you all of the hard shots, gets you live streams of the shows. If you're into that, you can watch us record live um, and see our smiling faces. I'm planning on doing an episode naked. I'm just, I'm, I'm letting you all know now that's my goal. Pants you, free one day too. Pants free. P pants free party. Um, and one day we'll do it like one, Jerry Duncan <laughs> and we'll do. We, we will not do that. No. Nobody, <laughs> nobody got that joke. Uh, I did. Mostly because they couldn't understand me. <laughs> um, yeah, if they were watching it on YouTube, yeah. they got it. Yeah. Um, we, you, you get a koozie. Uh, is there anything else we get? I think that's it. Yeah, the, the new koozies are awesome. They are uh, awesome. They, they, you see her shirt over here. This is yeah. some of our new swag. You get discounts. Yeah. So we're talking about new swag. We have the new shirts. These are the old shirts. They're all still up on teespring.com slash sixpack philosophy. We, um, we also have these nice little wall hangers you see That's if you're watching on canvas, canvas. canvas print. Yeah, if you're watching on YouTube, we, we got that behind us. All of those are available on teespring.com slash sixpack philosophy. And if you're one of our patrons and you're interested, yeah, the, the koozies, you just got to either write us, come live, or be a, if you're a patron, we send you one. Um, but if you want to get some of this stuff, 
uh, you can actually kind of benefit, depending on how much you're getting. Uh, we put discount codes every month on our patron. We do, we do. So you can get this stuff cheaper by by subscribing monthly, and we are more than happy uh, to, to, to get you whatever swag you want. You want a beach towel? Let me know. I will make you a beach towel. Yeah. So anyway, uh, if you thong. want... I'll make you a thong. We don't have thongs. <laughs> Not through Teespring, yeah. but I'll make you a thong. You're just going to like paint it? Like... Yeah. Anyway. It might be used. I, uh, no, it I was, might be a men's thong. I was about to say I'd like to have one, but then I just changed my mind. <laughs> so anyway... I was just going to use yours, actually. <laughs> So anyway, I think that's enough like of the, I wear underwear. enough plug for, for merch and Patreon. But if you do want to hear the hard talk we're about to do in international law, go check out our Patreon, yep. patreon.com slash six pack philosophy. Yeah. That'll be fun. Well, this was fun. All right. We good. With that, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We hope you've enjoyed this show um on uh treaties and the constitution and the supremacy clause and jazz. Um we should do a show on jazz. Go ahead. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We'll see you guys next week. Cheers. Cheers. Ooh. Oh, what a that sound. Loud. Six Pack Philosophy is supported by independent philosophers just like you. If you would like to support us, go to sixpackphilosophy.com and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.